Okay, so um, for the patch chat then, as I said, we're co-sponsoring with COS and we're just sort of working our way towards a new type of birding in coronavirus times. So um, the idea is you can go out and visit the site on your own and then uh, talk about it with us. And with this patch chat, we've got something special going on. We've got a birding blitz because we really want to get a good sense of where the birds are nesting. And so on our website, We've got a lot of instructions for that. If you haven't read those, you're very welcome to go out there, observe the birds, and if you observe any nesting behaviors, let us know where you saw it. Um, that'll really help us with our planning. And thanks to all the people who have done that already. Um, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, let me... Um, just tell you the Zoom basics and then one of our speakers needs to be let in. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can text him. But um, if you're new to Zoom, which you probably aren't, <laughs> down on the bottom there, there's a little chat box. You wanna be sure to click that so that the chat shows up on the side. And at any point you have a question, just type in the chat box. You can say hi now if you want or say write a cool bird that you've seen recently or something like that. And then also somewhere, for me, it's in the upper right-hand corner, there's like a little grid, and you can experiment with how many faces you see. You can, um, you can shrink that all the way down uh, so that when we're showing the, the pictures, you have more of a view and you don't have a lot of faces there. So that's in your control, uh, how many different faces that you see. Okay, so I think we're gonna start out with um, Alex Lamberg. And Alex is a CAS board member, and he lives not too far from Camp Pine, and he got involved in the habitat restoration out there. So he's the person that does the communications for our habitat restoration for Camp Pine. He's been working with Ken on the stewardship there. Um, and, uh, you know, he's a birder and just generally someone you should know. So I'm going to turn, that over, turn, turn this over to Alex. Well, thank, thank you, Judy. And I see some, uh, some Camp Pine uh, folks and volunteers on the call. So hello, everybody. Good to see your faces. It's been a few months since we've been able to convene on a regular basis. So I'm glad we're able to do it in this format. Um, just to give everybody a little bit of, I guess, background about how I uh, got involved with Camp Pine and how I really started birding there. Um, Judy mentioned that I'm involved in, in some of the restoration work, helping Ken out. Um, I moved from the city out to Des Plaines about two years ago, and when, when I was living in the city, I was about a mile from Montrose, so I had, you know, just this, this premier birding spot, basically my backyard, and I was really looking for some, some, some spots that were local to me in, in Des Plaines, and I was running the, the Des Plaines River Trail one day, and this was, this was during the summer, and, uh, you know, I, I, I came out of the woods into this, you know, this beautiful meadow with uh, all of these wildflowers in full bloom. And, and that was Camp Pine. And I just thought, wow, this is a, this is a special spot. This is a special place. I bet there's some great birding here. Um, and that's, that's how I really came to know Camp Pine. And then, you know, eventually met Ken and got involved in, in some of the, the habitat restoration efforts there. So it's really been uh, a great place to be involved in um, from a birding standpoint, but also um, from a habitat restoration standpoint and just meeting great people that, that come out to the volunteer days. Um, I also have two kids, uh, two young boys. So the time that I have available to actually get out and, and bird is limited. So what I, I kind of want to do is talk about uh, my typical day at Camp Pine if I, if I am getting out there for some birding. Um, you know, what you're, what you're likely to see, um, but also just some of the, some of the, the trails that I, that I, I use. Um, if, if folks can, I'm going to throw up a map real quick and. Can folks see the, the map that's uh, on the screen right now? Yeah, it's showing up okay. So uh, I, this isn't the best resolution, but if you're familiar with Camp Pine, there's a, a parking lot just off of Lake Avenue 
uh, kind of on the north side of Camp Pine. Um, that's where we usually will gather for, for restoration work. Um, and that's usually where I'll, I will start. Um, if I'm lucky, I will have maybe an hour, hour and a half where both of my boys are napping at the same time. And I can pop over to Camp Pine. I usually get about an hour, um, hours worth of birding in before I have to head home and, 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 and help my wife out. Um, so I, I have a, a, a little loop that I, that I typically will walk that takes about an hour to do. So where I'll start my day is, is in the parking lot. And this is a, an, an area that I think is, is often overlooked in Camp Pine. And it's actually, you're gonna hear from Ken, um, Ken Schaefer, our, our site steward at Camp Pine in just a few minutes here. But Ken, Ken kind of has a vision for actually the parking lot area at Camp Pine. Um, there's some really good brush piles and Ken's doing some work to get some, some, some native vegetation actually growing there and kind of has this vision for a, almost like a drive-in birding spot. So again, this is, uh, before, I, before I, I get out and start walking trails, I'll actually give the, the parking lot area a little look. Um, there's oftentimes in some of the, the brushy area just off the parking lot, um, a lot of uh, sparrow activity, um, seen a lot of white, uh, white crowned and white throated sparrows in that area. Um, so that's usually where I'll, where I'll start my day at Camp Pine is, is in the parking lot area and just kind of seeing um, you know, what, what birds are moving around there. And then um, I'll actually head south. So if, you, if you're familiar with Camp Pine, um, there's a trail that, that actually leads uh, south to what, what Ken refers to as the, the Eurasian Meadow. Um, and this is actually the site of a lot of our resta restoration work that Ken is gonna talk about. Um, I usually head south through there, which links up with, um, if you're looking at the map, you can see the section locate, or, uh, noted as CCC footprint. This is actually the, the location of, of um, some of the structures that were there. So when we uh, have some folks come on and talk about the history of Camp Pine, you'll learn a little bit more about that. Um, but some of the structures that were actually located um, within Camp Pine where it gets its name are, we're, we're in that area, CCC footprint. And there's actually a nice little path that, that kind of circles that area and that's my favorite spot to, to bird. Um, one of the things that I love about Camp Pine is the, the diversity of habitat. So you have the river on the west side of, 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 of the area. You have this great um, meadow um, with, uh, with a lot of uh, um, grassland birds. And then you have woodland as well as uh, um, shrubby areas too. So there's a, a really great diversity of habitat, which means we have a, a, a great diversity of birds all within a very um, small space. So I'll typically do this loop. Um, and the reason I like this loop that, that, that goes around this footprint, the, the camp footprint, is because you have the grasses, um, tall grasses, so um, see a, a, a really diverse mix of sparrows, um, Lincolns, uh, I mentioned white-throated and white-crowned, uh, swamp sparrows, uh, lots of field sparrows, um, tree sparrows, depending on the, the time of year you're there. And you also have these uh, kind of clumps of shrubs mixed in as well, which uh, provides you know, cover for a lot of different birds. And there's also a really great habitat for flycatchers. So um, really good mix of birds to see uh, just walking this, this, this really short loop. Um, which usually takes me about 45 minutes. Um, the other great thing is you have the, um, the woodland area kind of surrounding this. So you, you, know, you have uh, a lot of thrushes that you'll kind of see um, moving about uh, along the woodland edges, um, Eastern towies, um, Nashville warbler, uh, American red start, uh, black-throated green warbler, blue-headed vireo, uh, common yellow throat, scarlet tanagers, and eastern bluebirds are, are all birds that I see on a pretty regular basis, again, given the time of the year, just walking this little loop. Um, and then I'll typically end my walk um, on the path, the kind of the wooded path going back to, to the parking lot. This area is, is, is really special to me because this is where we've been doing a lot of the restoration work. And again, Ken will kind of talk about um, the kind of hows and whys of the restoration work that we're doing in the, the, this woodland area in particular. 
But what's been cool for me to see just within the last two years, so I've, I've really only been um, birding Camp Pine for, for about two years, but when I, first, when I first started coming out to this area, I would usually skip this portion. I'd, I'd kind of hightail it um, out to the meadow, and that's where I do the majority of my birding. Um, but not only is this, this, this woodland area near the river, so um, oftentimes you'll see wood ducks. Um, I believe we actually have some wood ducks nesting in this area right now. Um, uh, there's a barred owl that, that folks often will, will see in that area, but you're also likely to see belted kingfisher along the river too. But in this uh, woodland area, as I mentioned, when I first started coming out, it was really a dead zone. It was very quiet. Um, there was kind of a lack of bird song. This is an area that was kind of overtaken by uh, invasive plant species. Um, and in, in the, the short period of time that I've been involved with the restoration work and we've been able to um, kind of rejuvenate the native plant community in that area, the, the amount of bird song that I hear, the number of birds that I see in that area, um, in, in my mind at least, has dramatically increased. And that has been one of the, the most, uh, I think, rewarding things about being involved um, with, uh, with the Camp Pine Restoration Project, but also just birding this area is you can actually see the work that we're doing benefiting the, the, the bird community um, in this area. So I definitely recommend, you know, getting out, checking it out. There's a lot of unexplored areas. Um, the area of the map uh, um, that's noted as kind of the oak woodland um, and the shrub area. Those are areas that, that, that I haven't spent a lot of time in um, and I think that there's there's just a lot of cool things that are, are yet to be discovered uh, in, in, in this area. Judy, anybody else anything to add? You know, fun, fun sightings. Stephanie, I know you get out there on a pretty regular basis too. I was just out there today. Nice, excellent. The parking lot's open, so. Yes, yes, the parking lot's been closed for a long time, so it's, it's great to hear that it's open. Stephanie's one of our, our, our um, regular volunteers at the area and has joined us on some bird walks, so um, good to have you with us. Thanks. Judy, we can't hear you. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks, Alex. Thanks yeah. also. Uh, yeah, we contacted the park, the uh, forest preserves and asked them if they would open up the parking lot so that people could get out there and blitz. So uh, it should be open from now on, which is great. Okay, now we are getting ready to launch into new frontiers of Zoom. Uh, is everyone ready? Are you with me? Uh, so we've got um, Ken Schaefer. Ken doesn't have a computer, but he's got a phone. So he's on the phone, so I'm <laughs> going to show slides while he talks. Uh, and you all are the lucky, uh, lucky observers of this. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to just start. Um, let me uh, bring this up here. Oh, OK. We're starting already with a failure. Sorry. OK, here we go. Um, all right, so I'm going to share uh, a couple slides. I'm going to talk about a few, and then Ken is going to um, talk about the habitat restoration. So let me make sure I'm doing this right. Start with this one. OK, slideshow from current slide. OK, did I do that right? Everybody just sees a big uh, one big uh, picture there. Seems okay. Too big oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, great. So this is a picture of uh, Camp Pine. This is what it looks like. And, uh, you know, like maybe two-ish years ago, Chicago Audubon was thinking about um, where would be a nice uh, habitat restoration project for us. We were, felt like we were ready to take on something else. And we knew that Camp Pine was a place that had had both cuckoos, chat, blue wing warbler, brown thrasher, field sparrow, uh, kingbird, you know, a long list of shrubland birds of conservation concern. And there are a lot of grasslands in the region um, that are being restored for grassland birds, but there are very few people that are really working on um, shrubland habitat for nesting shrubland birds. And so we thought that'd be a great project for us to just kind of do uh, 
see what it takes to, to restore habitat for nesting shrubland birds. So uh, this picture on the left is pretty typical of what pine looks like. You see a big tree there. The birds sit in the tree, uh, you know, poop out seeds and then uh, invasive uh, brush and other kind and native brush grows up underneath the tree. So if you walk around Campine, you just see that scene repeated kind of over and over again. And then you also have these very dense, brushy borders um, on the edges. And some of the, the grasslands are filling in with brush as well. Um, uh, on the right, you can see what happened, you know, if you look close up, this is a patch that's pretty good. It's got um, gray dogwood in it, which is uh, a native. And it's also got a viburnum which uh, we think is probably not native. Ken might talk a little more about that, but um, it, it functions well and it doesn't seem to be super invasive. So we're, we're keeping that one around. Um, some of the other, um, this is another shrub that we've got a lot of there, which is Illinois rose, those sort of arching canes that you see there. And um, another one is the nanny berry. Uh, I don't, can you see my cursor? This, um, this little plant uh, here, you know, it just shows how you've got uh, the nanny berry, you've got uh, gray dogwood, a number of different shrubs here growing up in the grass. And what we try to do is when we see them in these big clumps, you know, we can, we can flag them so that we don't remove them. And again, Ken is gonna talk a lot more about this. This is just one more native shrub that we observe there. Uh, this one is wafer ash. Wafer ash likes uh, limestone ledges. And so because this used to be a former camp and it's got these limestone trails, uh, the wafer ash is very happy there. Um, this, you know, used to be a big um, row of buckthorn and um, the volunteers cut some of the buckthorn out so that the wafer ash could thrive there. Um, so that was, uh, you know, what we knew about Camp Pine and we thought, well, well, this would be a great place for us to do a habitat restoration. We went and looked at it a couple times, a few people from Chicago Audubon, and I think on our second visit, we found the most important discovery of all of the discoveries out there, which was Ken Schaefer sitting in the parking lot having coffee. Because Ken, Yay. yeah, <laughs> Ken uh, is, uh, you know, like a, a major guru when it comes to native shrubs and the discovery that he had coffee in this place every morning and loved the place and was dying uh, to restore it was a very felicitous uh, discovery. So uh, that, that began a, a beautiful partnership, which um, is what you're going to hear <laughs> about today. So I'm going to just... Um, turn this over. At the time, Ken was um, working at uh, Oakton Community College, so he was the person that was doing all the habitat restoration at the college there. He's super knowledgeable. He's a steward, you know, with the North Branch um, Restoration Project, and, uh, you know, now he, he is the steward at, um, at Camp Pine, so I'm going to, and he's now retired, so he's got ton of time. So I'm going to now turn it over to Ken and Ken. So Ken, we're looking at the picture uh, that where you want to talk about burning. Oh, okay. Could I give a little overview of the whole Camp Pine site first? I just want you to so know the whole the screen. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. The whole site is now considered a 500 acre site and it includes Beck Lake, um, Dam Number Two Woods, three picnic groves, um, two sides of the Des Plaines River, and then a lot of um, upland woods, wet woods, wet prairies, dry prairies, um, reconstructed prairies. Um, so you, there is a lot of habitat. And I look, I've been looking at this initially um, from a plant point of view. I'm a plant person. And I, I hear the birds in the background, but I don't distinguish which is which. So this is very intriguing to me also. Um, we're working mostly on a, about a 30 to 35 acre area. And the first emphasis was in the remnant prairie as been, has been described. And somehow I think the, the prairie remnant was strong enough to keep a lot of these shrubs at bay and hence their shrubs and prairie. Um, let's see, the first 
workday that we had, we were cutting out non-native species out of native species. And that is extremely tedious. Um, for such a large area, it would take way too long. And so my focus has changed a bit where I would rather have fire um, uh, be the main driving management tool in this area. The fire will go into um, the shrub um, clumps, um, set them back a bit, allow some native prairie plants to strengthen on the edges. And then the idea will be when the little um, buckthorns and such come back is to um, herbicide them, but then leaving all the good plants, good shrubs that are coming up. And um, so I think it'll keep things open because that's obviously really important. Um, there's adjacent to it, as was also mentioned, was the Eurasian meadow, which was the um, uh, proper for the camp itself. And it's, it's interesting, there's, there's several um, you know, large, now dead trees all around the area. And as Judy was mentioning, birds sit in them, poop out the buckthorn berries. And so there's all of these islands, these of quite a bit of buckthorn in this reconstructed uh, prairie, which is still under underway, of course. And so, you know, that's a major dilemma. If it's all you have is buckthorn, what are you going to do? Well, you know, so our thought is to, to burn it, you know, to get things back um, a little bit further. Um, so they don't keep creeping out, but also what has not happened yet, the idea would be to f go out and find the female buckthorns and basil bark herbicide them so the, um, the males can live. There's a male and a female tree, and hence we wouldn't have the problem with the seeds. And all these buckthorns, what's also great, we want to keep them as structure for vines. Most of them have vines on them. The most common would be the grapes and the um, Virginia creeper, and there's some um, bristly cat's briar. And so it's, it's, it's very interesting to keep stuff that I'm used to getting rid of, you know, for habitat. Um, so, you know, the, and so after this, um, so we're, we're doing all this, and I thought, well, if we're going to manage this by fire, the, the woodlands that we park by and that go into that Alex was talking about, oh, it was just a dis disgusting mess of uh, buckthorns and way, way, way too many sugar maples. And um, so wanted to get that area opened up too so that there's, there's area from the river to the floodplain um, up into the woodlands. Um, and so that we have taken off, you know, done extremely well with already. A um, few of us are chainsawers for the forest preserve, and we just go out and chain, chainsaw down um, sugar maples. Um, and so in, in the woods, um, very few shrubs. And so shrub seeds have been collected, and they are being um, just planted along the, 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 mostly along the ridge that goes down to the floodplain to try to create some kind of hedge in that area. Um, so it's extremely interesting to try to figure all this stuff out. And another thing I've been working with is, you know, when you, if you've got vines and you've got to get rid of trees, you know, how do you, what do you do with them? Well, if you basal bark trees, they could stay in there, but also you have to leave the little trees, like the ashes and the elms, even if they're only two or three feet tall, because in theory, those will be growing up um, to hold the vines as these other basil bark trees are falling down. So also, you know, toying with trying to create habitat that way. Then, of course, the ashes and the elms will eventually die, and that'll be more bird habitat. Um, so that's, it's a thought. Um, let's see. So where are you with your slide, Judy? You're on the clump? Uh, I'm on the seeds. Oh, you're in the seeds. Okay. And so that's one thing. So, so the seeds, um, it was um, known that 
other than the prairie remnant, did not have a lot of native species on site. And the whole Des Plaines River area is, is quite degraded. And so I have permission to collect seeds from Lake Cook Road down to Park Ridge. Um, I've been able to find a lot of little colonies of things all over the place, including a lot of shrubs, um, which I'm doing a little micromanaging with, which is going to be another project in coming years. Um, but was able to bring in 60 to 70 new species into Camp Pine, whether the woodlands or the prairies to, you know, to bring back some of the species. Now in the, um, let's see, I should say in the Eurasian meadow, that's where the prairie seeds go. I'm not throwing seeds into the remnant prairie yet because um, I'd rather try to get them growing in the remnant. And then also seeds are being put into the, uh, shrub seeds are being put into the remnant to try to get them to replace the um, um, buckthorns. And so you, you've got that picture, the naked ground of the woods, right? The, uh, as Alex said, that was, I have never seen such a thickly haunted woods in my life. You know, it's been a working woods since the 30s. And you know, there's, there's um, evidence of buildings and telephone poles and cables and such. And I'm sure it was tromped to pieces by people. And there was abs and it was so dark with the, um, the sugar maples that it was just silent. You know, I was just absolutely stunned. And there was no leaves even on the ground. So like 99.9% .9 barren. Well, over two years of seeding and thinning out the um, um, sugar maples mostly, starting to really get a lot of um, plants, to, herbaceous plants to come in. I'm not seeing the shrubs yet, those will take a, a while, but also another component of the woodlands is it's also, a, you know, like I said, it's a dying woodlands and the big oak trees, the big red oaks, um, 200 plus years old, they're coming down, they're all sickly. And so try to save the woods. Um, and so last year, probably about 35 hickories and oaks germinated, they were squirrel planted and they have been caged. And so a lot of them made it through the winter and then they went underwater with the flood. Some of them were set back, but most are coming back. So we're trying to create a whole new woodlands also. And then as these oaks are growing, it'll take a while, um, you know, they'll serve as shrubs also. Um, so, you know, just try to throw, and I'm just looking to create all different scenarios. There's an area that was brush cut that's, that's very wet. Um, so all the buckthorns and ashes are down. They were about six feet high. A lot of good stuff came back, and then surrounding them are dense uh, patches of buckthorn. And those may even be, um, you know, areas for bird habitat. Um, you know, it's kind of small, but, you know, my whole thought is just to create different atmospheres um, to see what happens. And let's see, what else? Um, I don't know, that kind of says it all right there. Um, Judy, do you have other things to bring in? Uh, no, you know what? I think we're right on time and, um, uh, yeah, we got to the last slide. Yep. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, good. Yeah. And then if, if people have questions, you know, Ken obviously can talk a lot more about a lot of things. So I just put them in the chat and then we will use the chat to, um, to continue this discussion during the discussion time. Um, but for right now, we've got a few uh, other people who are going to be yep. Good. joining us. Um, okay, and I have managed to, sorry, ah. that, uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving uh, like a little uh, technical challenge here. My apologies. Okay, great. Thanks, um, thanks so much, Ken. So, um, yeah. So uh, next, what we're going to do is uh, John <clears throat> Elliott <clears throat> is going to give us a little bit of history of the site. And John Elliott um, used to work right across the street at River Trail Nature Center as a director there. So he's very familiar with it. And he is also on our board. He's our program chair. OK. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Can, am I on? Let's see. I've got. Uh, 
that's good. I'm having technical difficulties here too, so. <laughs> um, I want to show you a, a little bit of a history of the area. Um, are you seeing a map? No. No. Okay, uh, I need to get on the share screen. Oh boy. Oh, I could put it up. Well, I'm, I'm looking for a, a, a very specific map. I've lost my Zoom screen completely. Try hitting escape. So I'm still on, but I can't see you guys. I can see Judy. That's all I can see. And that said it wanted me to leave the meeting. Can you go on to uh, Jerry, perhaps? Yeah, so sure. I figure this out. Okay, great. Okay, good. So um, we're going to skip um, John and then Pat has an interesting footnote and um, we can hear from Jerry Atari, who um, works at River Trail Nature Center as a naturalist and uh, he takes great photographs. I don't know if anybody else follows him on Instagram. I always enjoy seeing his photographs of his kids as well as bird photos. Uh, and we are uh, happy to have him uh, with us. So I'm going to share my screen because I've got his photos on um, on my screen. So let's see if I can turn slide. Okay, good. Does that look good? Yeah. Well, thanks, Judy. Um, hi, everybody. Um, yes, I'm a natural river trail and um, it's interesting that I go before John because, you know, John is one of those folks that did a lot at River Trail Nature Center. But um, one of my favorite things doing there is um, photography, being able to show people the gems that are at River Trail, such as the birds that you're going to see on some of these slides. But um, River Trail is one of those nature centers that location is just amazing on the banks of the Des Plaines River. You're talking about a lot of um, varied habitat, you know, similar to what Alex was mentioning, because we're right there within the floodplain of the Des Plaines River, you know, from floodplain um, forest, uh, you know, the, the wetlands, the backwaters of the Des Plaines River, um, a little bit of prairie um, across the river as well. But this, the diverse habitats really provide the types of area that many birds are able to take advantage of um, from the songbirds to the birds of prey. Um, it's really a great location to do birding. And I, I haven't really, it wasn't until I started doing photography that I really started noticing these birds and it's been a lot of fun, um, but also an opportunity to really showcase the location. I do um, kind of, um, take care of the Facebook page. So giving people a chance to see what is actually at our location since not everybody gets the chance to be at this location. But I definitely encourage folks um, to come and bird. You know, we'll be opening soon in July in terms of our grounds. Um, but a lot of these birds that you'll see are around the bird feeders, um, around the building itself because with all that's, you know, with programming and everything, I don't get the chance to go further out as much as possible. So these birds that you're seeing are mostly around um, the nature center building themselves. Um, but again, we do have a lot of photographers that come and take advantage of the birds that are around. Um, but, you know, in some areas better than most outside our fence line, but buckthorn is a huge issue that we've been dealing with. Um, but also the loss of shrubbery um, around the nature center with the deer population. We've lost a lot of shrubs um, around um, river trails. So that kind of sets back um, some birds, but still um, we do have a, a great variety of birds that come through, you know, even in the winter, it's a great place to see um, some of the resident birds. So Judy, you can keep going by but like the hummingbirds great place to see them this spring actually these photos are all from this past spring um and it seems like 
the whole situation of not having people around, it's really been great for the birds, you know? Um, so we've had a lot of different species come through. Um, there were redheads there a couple of weeks ago. I wasn't working at the time, so I missed those, I apologize. Um, but lots of Orioles um, were out this past spring, just beautiful. Just amazing to see them all over. I mean, we really had a tough time keeping those jelly feeders um, full, um, but um, lots of beautiful birds there. So um, we also have um, not as many in terms of um, man-made structures um, for some birds, but tree swallows, we do have some gourds um, on our back lawn that the tree swallows um, seem to really like. Though uh, we do have, well, last year we had a pair of bluebirds that took over um, these nests. And that year we really didn't have any um, successful tree swallow nestings because of the bluebirds. Um, but there are quite a few of them this past spring here. Um, Wetlands. Now, with all the spring rains that we've been getting, the wetland birds, it's just amazing when you're, you know, go off trail some areas and it's just so many different types of wetland birds, especially the wood ducks, which are very hard to photograph. Other people have a good t uh, uh, luck getting them, but I never seem to get close enough to get even better shots, but it's a great location to see a lot of um, wetland birds in the backwaters. Uh, let's see what else, warblers. Uh, so the warblers are very new to me. Um, with my camera, I'm starting to notice more and more that I really didn't see before. Uh, but this is also on the back lawn. Um, but not just visually, but audibly, when you hear a lot of these birds singing, it's definitely amazing to be in this place with all these birds. Um, so again, if you haven't been to our location, I definitely encourage you, come on your own, you know, come as a group and just enjoy the bountiful birds that we have at this location. And since we're not that far from Camp Pine, you know, you get to go there, you get to come back. Either way, you're really going to have a great time with birding. So, and I'm sure John can add some more since he's really had a history there. So, <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Jerry. Uh, that was great. John, are you ready? Do you think? Well, I think so. <laughs> I figured out it was another Zoom button that I hit by accident that I didn't know existed and I had to figure out how to get out of it. So I, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to make this uh, process, this uh, very, very interesting, um, oh, there we go, uh, history of the area brief. We need to acknowledge first off that all of this area after the glaciers receded was home to Native Americans. The Indians were up and down the river in many different uh, tribes activity. We don't, uh, I don't know that history well enough to tell you all of it anyway, but Albert Scharf was an amateur archaeologist who made this map in 1900 that showed an Indian, major Indian village just south. This Camp Pine would be about right here on his map. This is the very north end of his map. So the Indians uh, used the Des Plaines River as soon as it was available from the ice up and down. There are chipping stations, there are a few villages, there are many other uh, signs of their presence. They're pretty hard to find if you don't really know what you're looking for. But we do need to acknowledge that this was home to many different people before um, those we say us, we got here relatively late and acquired these properties in one way or another from the Native Americans. The geology of the area is uh, also very interesting and we don't, that's another two hour lecture. This is a map that was made about 1932 that maps the geology of the area. And basically it shows that we had this um, alluvial stuff down in the river valley and what's called uh, glacial valley terrain. It's stuff, sand and gravel primarily that was washed out um, from the glaciers still receding to the north and deposited by the glacial rivers, which were much wider and bigger than the uh, river, the Des Plaines River today. So that's of an interesting uh, aspect of it as well, which is another whole series. 
So um, in the 1820s and 30s, uh, European settlers, for the most part, started to move into the area. This is a topographic map, one of the first, the first earliest one I've been able to find from 1900 that shows here the Grove shows up on this map. Milwaukee Avenue shows up on this map uh, here. Very little else in the way of roads in the area, railroad over here that still exists, railroad down here going through the small town of Des Plaines in 1900. And you can see <clears throat> these are five foot contour intervals, so there's very little elevation change from down by the river up to the Grove, maybe 10 or 15 feet of elevation at the most. In 1927, the topographic map shows quite a bit more development. We've got Milwaukee Avenue now as a major highway. We've got River Road that has been developed, but and still not too much going on in the way of activity here at Camp Pine. We have this road, this interesting road here, which uh, goes right through what is now Camp Pine. And I've not really been out and tried to look for any remnants of that road. Frequently when we go out, we can find those. So that's another thing on my list of things to do. This is actually north of Kent Pine, up about Lake Avenue. River Trail Nature Center would be up here, road down here to what's now River Trail. And dam number two was in existence by that time. The Forest Preserve District built uh, dams to promote recreation along the river in the 20s. The Forest Preserve District was created in 1914-15, uh, started buying land in 1915-16. And in their 1918 annual report, their map shows that part of the property was in the River Trail Nature Center at Camp Pine had already been acquired, not, not all of it. It was some of the first properties the Forest Preserve District acquired because one of their targets was to acquire land in the floodplain for flood protection and for natural purposes. So that's 1957. Um, history starts to get a whole lot more interesting in terms of our modern history. In, uh, in the 1930s. In 1938, the Civilian Conservation Corps created what was not Camp Pine. It was Camp Des Plaines Valley. It was not called Camp Pine by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And this is a photo from 1938 that you can get from the Illinois State Geological Survey if you know how to look for them. And it shows all the buildings at the camp at its when it was new. And probably the campers originally lived in tents while they started the work. But the uh, headquarters building was probably this building right in here, where this little loop drive came in. The parking, there's dam number two, our park, parking lots back up the driveway here a little ways. And the camp footprint was in this kind of unusual, almost triangular shape, because most of the camp diagrams that I've seen show them to be fairly much a grid. This one was on this triangle. Um, it was a segregated camp, white only, as almost all of the CCC camps were. There was one African-American camp down the river and now what Sunset Bridge Evans Field area, a small camp that was only there for a short time. But all the others that I know of in Cook County were segregated white only. Um, they were military style uh, camps for young men that did various kinds of work. The CCC built the trails along the display river through this area. Some of the old culverts, stonework is still there. And they, uh, when they were done building trails, the men, a uh, relatively small camp here, about 400 men probably at the most, worked on the Skokie Lagoons project along with men from other camps throughout the area. The CCC ended in 1942 as all the young men went to the war. Um, the uh, buildings, a lot of them look like this. Pat can tell us whether or not this looks like one of the buildings she experienced when she was at the Girl Scout camp. This is not at Camp Pine, but is a very typical CCC building as one of the other forest preserve camps. In the, uh, during the, the uh, World War II, this was something I just learned recently. There was something called Camp Des Plaines Valley that was part of a uh, project, was a women's army, a women's labor, youth, uh, women's land army and youth land army that worked on farms throughout the uh, United States during World War II when so many men were gone. And um, there's not a whole lot of detail of what exactly happened at, at still called Camp Des Plaines Valley. Probably was boys 14 to 16 years old. There's some indication that it might have been a Jewish youth organization that sponsored this particular group. There was a group of girls that uh, were housed at what's uh, was the Northwestern uh, Methodist campground just down the river. And they worked for uh, prevailing wages for youth 
wage laborers at that time. And um, that lasted from 1942 through 1945. And in this particular topographic map from 1953, the USGS, very good about them cleaning buildings. See lots more buildings over here across the river now. St. Mary Cemetery shows up in the school, and the buildings are still here. They show the roadway around the camp area in 1953, which would have been the time when it was a Girl Scout camp. Girl Scouts started using it in 1948. I'm not sure exactly how long they used it. That may be able to help a little bit. Through the early 60s, at least. At least one of the camps that was used as a Girl Scout camp out in the South Suburbs was used in the early 70s by the Girl Scouts. So by the 1963 topographic map, though, you can see that their uh, buildings are mostly still there. Some of them have begun to disappear. You also see that this is all shown as open area. The green represents forest, so woodland growth on these maps and the white is open area. So by 1963, many of the buildings were gone, but the barracks were still there along each one of these arms. By 1973, the topographic map, all the buildings are gone and the roadways are showing up. So the buildings were raised from the period gradually, a few at a time through 1953 to sometime in the early 70s. So now we have our uh, Aerial photograph that shows the footprint of the old camp. You can still kind of see the outline of where these barracks would have been, by where the shrubs remain, where the roadway would have gone around it. And then this area that shows is that non-wooded area. This is our shrub prairie zone that we're working on now. And just as a highlight, uh, Wharton was out with me this morning feeding the mosquitoes. Thank you, Wharton, for contributing so much blood to the mosquitoes this morning, along with us. And we got to see the uh, butterfly weed starting to bloom. And so we did start the restoration project. We initiated uh, surveys in 2017. We got our forest reserve permission to begin the restoration work in 2018 and really took off last year in 2019, thanks to Ken and many other volunteers. And that's my thumbnail history. And this is the map that we saw earlier, so. Will, uh, oh, thanks so much, John. It's a fascinating uh, history, a really interesting place to walk around. Okay, so now we are going to hear from Pat Miller, who has an amazing uh, connection to the place, and she's a former Chicago Audubon board member as well. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I was a Girl Scout at Camp Pine in the 1960s, um, and I, I did contact the, my dog just jumped off the sofa, um, I contacted the Girl Scout office um, and they had never heard of Camp Pine. They were really intrigued by it, but they weren't able to find any information from the Girl Scout record. So all I can do is tell you about my own experiences, which were a long time ago. So as far as I know, the camp was never a traditional sleepaway camp. It didn't really have the facilities for that. For example, there was no place to go swimming or canoeing or anything like that. So it was a day camp. And you could also um, go and stay in the barracks for like a weekend overnight trip. Um, so I went to two weeks of day camp there in the summers of 1963 and 1964. I'm almost certain. I was only eight and nine years old, so I'm not 100% sure of the dates, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, and so what we did, I remember how to you know, learning how to tie knots and we did crafts like we made leaf collages and um, braided th those lanyards from those, those thin um, plastic um, strips. And we made God's eyes from yarn and we'd pick up twigs on the ground and use those for God's eyes. And in case you don't know what a God's eye is, I made one today. <laughs> I, found some, I found some twigs in my in Dearborn Park when I was walking my dogs and I have a big stash of yarn. So this is a God's eye. It's originally um, from Mexico and um, it's really a decorative object, but some of the indigenous and Catholic people in Mexico think it has magical powers. I think in our case, it was just a really good way to keep a bunch of eight-year-olds busy for an afternoon, but it was fun. I still remember how to make it after 58 years. Um, um, and so and we also went for a hike every day, um, a short hike, because we were very young. And the thing I remember most about those hikes was I saw my first snake and I'm, we were told it was a garter snake. I'm assuming that's true. I thought that was pretty cool. 
I have absolutely no recollection of anything related to birds. I wasn't birding then, unfortunately. I wish I had been. Um, our scout troop also uh, spent a couple weekend overnights at the camp um, in 1965 and 1966, which is the year it sort of officially shut down, according to what I know. So we do things like cook our meals over the campfire and make s'mores and sing songs and you know go for hikes. But the thing I remember most about Camp Pine is that we were so thrilled to be staying in the barracks where the POWs had lived because Hogan's Heroes started on TV in 1965 and it was like a number one show and we were all crazy about it. So we just thought it was totally <laughs> cool to be staying in the POW barracks. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Pat. Uh, Can I uh, back up just briefly on Pat's comment that I, I was reading my outline too quickly and I completely skipped the POW camp period, which was 1945 to 1946, and uh, German prisoners who worked also worked on farms for a minimal wage while they were kept before they were repatriated and you know, to go back home. And that is when it became known as Camp Pine, for whatever reason, that's the first uh, use of the name Camp Pine. Sorry about my, my oversight. Okay, great. All right, so now we're gonna hear from uh, Stephanie Bilkey, who is um, uh, at, out at the site doing a community science project that she's gonna tell us about. And she um, works with Audubon Great Lakes and is a COS board member. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Just have a few slides here. So um, like Judy said, I do uh, climate watch surveys at Camp Pine and I'll Go really quickly over this. You can find out more information. I can drop this link in the chat if you want to learn more about what Climate Watch is. But basically, there's um, this is a program through National Audubon Society. That's a community science program that's looking at how um, bird ranges are expected to shift due to climate change, and then um, going to places um, throughout their range and seeing if. Um, those shifts are actually happening by, um, we do point counts and you select basically a 10 by a 10 kilometer or six by six mile approximately square that's in this kind of like grid map showing here in step two. And um, you do 12 point counts in spring and winter. And we're focusing on groups of species and they chose for the first couple of species that they were interested in were nut hatches and bluebirds because you can find both or types of those groups of birds throughout the US and um, they're a little bit more beginner friendly. You don't have, so it's um, meant for anyone to participate no matter your bird experience. You'd only have to learn like one or two species. And um, then you go out and you conduct these five minute point, point counts just one day um, between January 15th and February 15th. And then again in May 15th and June 15th. And then you submit all your data on eBird. So um, I chose Camp Pine and it was kind of incidental. I just looked at a map and I was like, this uh, looks like not hatch habitat. And it's a you know, reasonable distance from where I live. I'd never been there before. So it was in, the, in, the, in part kind of random, but I'm really glad I chose this site um, because I have found a lot of nut hatches there, but I've also found a variety of meat birds that I wasn't even really expecting to find, um, not having any knowledge of what the site is like. So this is my, my survey route that I do. There's 12 survey points. And I originally thought that I was gonna start at the north end, but then I showed up there in um, January and found out that the parking lot was closed. So I actually run this um, from the south and then go north. And um, some interesting finds, uh, I have found several nut hatches. They're usually easier to find in the winter. And um, I just love being able to go out to this site in the winter because it's a lot quieter and gives me an excuse to bird in the winter, which you know is always fun because you, 
I, or I don't get out as much in the winter. So, um, and I, I found some really neat birds there. Uh, and my first visit that I went uh, in um, January of 2018, I found great horned owl and barred owl in the, in the winters. So that was, that was really cool and unexpected. And there was just a lot of bird activity, which I, I, you know, didn't know if I would find in the winter. Um, in the springtime, some of the bird highlights I've found, um, actually just walking past this uh, landfill, I think it is, is um, I found some grassland birds there just walking along this fence. Um, I've had, uh, I believe, dick thistle and bobolink. Um, I've had morning warbler in the exact same point um, in multiple years, so I, that led me to believe that they might be breeding there as well as hooded warbler almost exactly in the same spot uh, multiple years. Um, so um, I also have a couple pictures. This is just showing the contrast, not the exact same spot, but what my trail looks like in the winter versus spring. Um, it's, it's not a, exactly a clear, clear trail in the winter, but um, that's what it looks like this, this spring. And it was also really muddy. So I was really glad that I, I brought my, um, rubber boots with me. Here's just a picture of a, a baby barred owl that was being fed mm -hmm. by a parent. <laughs> so that was that was pretty exciting. He was um, talking quite a lot and begging <laughs> during my survey, which is just neat to see them during the day. Sorry for the, the poor quality photos. This is with my phone. And then um, some more <laughs> kind of phone pictures. My favorite found, find from last spring was getting to see an all-sided flycatcher, which is here on the left, and then um, a northern shrike during my winter survey. So that's all I have for, for photos. But then I also, um, let's see, am I, am I showing, let's see, am I sharing this? Uh, I just wanted to point out that if you're in, more interested in Climate Watch, there's also this really cool interactive map through Audubon's website where you can zoom in and see um, results of the surveys from 2016 to 2018. And this is showing um, for white-breasted nuthatch, the blue areas show areas where it's supposed to be worsening for um, climate conditions for the species during the winter and yellow is improving and a lot of the maps look like this because you actually see an expectation that you know as climate as the climate becomes warmer species begin shifting north and these bubbles are showing where surveys have take taken place and you can just zoom in on this map and see um, all these brown um, dots indicate um, where people have found white-breasted nuthatches and they also have data for um, bluebirds as well. So that's all I got. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, yeah, so I think um, we're gonna skip the quiz. <laughs> and um, let's just, I know we're over time, but if you wanna stick around, there are some good questions. So um, I will turn it over to Audubon's uh, Program and Communications Manager, Antonio Flores, and he's going to um, make sure all of our questions get asked. Hi everyone, um, this has been awesome. Thank you everyone who spoke. Um, there's a couple of questions that came in. So I believe it's directed to Ken, but I'm not sure. Can you speak about the management regimen? Uh, it looks like there's fire sometimes. And Thank, going you. On. Thank you for offering. Yes, I know there is a little more. Well, we can put it up in the fridge if we don't need it this time. Uh -oh. <laughs> Let's see, can we mute Eleanor? Uh, um, and then also there was a question about um, deer management. Is that like a county level program or how do those decisions get made? Anyone who wants the to jump deer in. management, you know, the Forest Reserve has deer management, but it's very secret. And so I don't know what it is, um, but it's, it's the um, Forest Reserve through with the Department of Agriculture that make the decisions. Now, um, when I, with the little, the little trees that are growing and such, and a few little things that I did put in, I have caged them because the deer will eat them. And so I, I, I don't think it's too bad, but you know, they're there. 
and I don't know what the question does answer is. So, um, considering um, the no hunting ban in Cook County and on the controversy around it, um, the deer population is such an issue that something has to be done about it. Um, so yes, there is um, a, there is a plan um, for deer management and um, IDNR um, are the ones that determine and issue the permits for that. So it's not, you know, it's not something that we take lightly, but it's something that um, for the benefit of habitats and stuff, um, um, a permit is required to actually do some management. So, you know, we, it's one of those things that yes, we do carry it out and everything, but you know, we make sure that it's well controlled and that kind of stuff. So you don't really hear too much about it, but um, deer management um, does happen. Um, thank you. Um, does anyone know if there was ever a pine plantation at any point on the grounds? Pine plantation? I don't think so. I've never seen I've any. I've never seen any oh. indication of it. I've never been able to right. find out any reason why it was called Camp Pine. There's a fairly extensive report that was done a couple years ago about the site, and they don't say anything about why the pine, why the name, where the name came from. It's a mystery to me. <laughs> there, as far as I know, there's never been. If you look yeah. at those photographs, the old aerial photographs, there's nothing that looks like pines or pine plantation anywhere, anywhere yeah. nearby. The only thing I've heard is there's actually only one pine tree on the site, or at least there used to only be one. There is pine tree. one that's there. Yeah, and it was there was a theory that it was planted by the Girl Scouts um, in the 1950s. There, nobody knows if that's true, but they think the Girl Scouts planted it um, as a commemoration of the of the name of the camp. So that makes <laughs> sense for the age of the pine tree and where it is, but that doesn't explain why the name came before that. <laughs> so, maybe maybe pine was a person. Maybe, a tree. Maybe, maybe, people, maybe people are like me and don't know their trees. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. On that note, I'm handing it over. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay, thanks, everyone. Uh, sorry we went a little over, but um, thanks for hanging with us. I think this was a really enjoyable program. I really want to thank all of our speakers and uh, for their time and their expertise. Um, our next program is going to be a live bird walk at McKinley Park, July 11th and 25th. So we're going back to some uh, of the live programming. Uh, we hope you can join us. Uh, we are we do have some interesting Zoom programs coming up, which we'll be announcing really soon. Um, if you're a member, uh, you'll get notice of it. You can join our mailing list or follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, for, for our next announcements. Um, so we got some good ones coming up. So again, thank you very much and uh, good night. Good night all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.